Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to CSPC 2022 pre-conference sessions. My name is Nihal Al-Hadi, and I'm a Science and Technology Editor at The Conversation Canada. Thank you for joining us today. I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. I am in Toronto, or Toronto, which is situated on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, Haudenosaunee, and Huron-Wendat peoples. This land is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Toronto is covered under several treaties, including the Toronto Purchase, or Treaty 13, and the Dish with One Spoon Agreement. The closest community to us is the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The title of today's panel is Trust in Science, the Science in Trust. Um, today's meeting, today's session will be conducted in a meeting format. So if your cameras are turned on, we are able to see you, but I do ask that you please keep yourself muted throughout. We will be taking questions at the end, either through the chat line, or you can raise your hand if you'd like to unmute yourself and turn your video on to ask a question directly. Society has greatly benefited from innovations in systems, processes, and technologies that have been largely developed through scientific advancement. Given the scope and scale of addressing global challenges, such as environmental sustainability and climate change, it is critical that the public trust science and the application of scientific knowledge across all disciplines to inform society's decision-making and policies. The COVID-19 pandemic has illustrated the multifaceted impacts a global crisis can, can inflict on the health, economic and social well-being of citizens. And we've seen how scientific collaboration and knowledge mobilization can lead to tangible solutions. However, we have also seen the consequences of developing and adopting those solutions when there are varying levels of public trust and scientific evidence. How do we gain that public trust when it comes to addressing global challenges? Well, we need to foster greater public engagement in research, most notably with diverse and inclusive communities, and better integrate multidisciplinary science into policy making. We also need to improve the ways that we communicate and teach science. What are innovative ways to strengthen the trust between science and society to better inform decision making and policy development that will have lasting benefits? How do we engage and build trusted relationships with key populations in the pursuit and use of scientific knowledge? This panel is intended to provide new insights from education programs, new public opinion research, and convene events with stakeholders from the Canada Foundation for Innovation, Genome Canada and Genome BC on key trends around Canadians' perceptions of science, including genomics and its benefits, as well as from the research of Dr. Jagrus Hodson to better understand the role of misinformation and disinformation in building trust in science. As a science and technology editor at The Conversation Canada, I am committed to communicating scientific research to as wide and diverse an audience as possible. For those of you who don't know, the Conversation Canada is an independent source of news and views from the academic and research community delivered direct to the public. So academics and researchers at university institutions write about their research directly. Our motto is academic rigor, journalistic flair. Part of our charter includes commitments to inform public debate with knowledge-based journalism that is responsible, ethical, and supported by evidence. We also seek to unlock the knowledge of researchers and academics to provide the public with clarity and insight into society's biggest problems and what is being done about them. We provide a fact-based and, and editorially independent forum free of commercial or political bias. I'm really pleased to be here and to introduce today's panelists to you. I'm going to start off with Sally Greenwood who brings over 25 years of experience in the nonprofit healthcare and social services sectors to her role as Vice President Communications and Societal Engagement at Genome BC. Sally is an expert in strategic communications and issues management, and she leads the organization in achieving the highest visibility and credibility possible through a broad array of engagement activities. She is passionate about engaging today's youth and that the pursuit of a strong STEAM ecosystem will drive a vibrant society and economy and STEAM here means science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. After pursuing a graduate degree in journalism and some time in that field, 
Sally applied her passions for communications and people to the healthcare sector, where she held senior positions with BC Transplant, the BC Centre for Disease Control, and Community Living BC. Sally is an expert in crisis and strategic communications and has supported Genome BC in the areas of education, communications, and societal engagement since 2009. Perry Johnston leads Genome Canada's federal advocacy and policy agenda while raising awareness of the organization's mission and cross-sectoral impact among parliamentarians, senior officials, industry, community partners, and the public. Guided by the belief that genomics can change the world if responsibly and equitably applied, Perry builds strategic partnerships among diverse stakeholders to advance the role and impact of genomics in society. Perry was also a founding board member of the Conversation Canada, La Conversation Canada, the National Digital Media Organization for Academic Journalism, where I am at. She has an MA in International Affairs from Carleton University and a BA in French Literature from the University of Regina, which is where I got my Bachelor of Journalism, Perry. Um, Dr. J. Gris Hodson is the Canada Research Chair, Tier 2 in Digital Communication for the Public Interest. Her SHRC and CIHR funded research examines the ways that misinformation can be mitigated through digital communication efforts, particularly those targeted at the research community. Thus, her current work examines such interdisciplinary topics as educational interventions to address COVID-19 related misinformation, the online harassment of diverse researchers, the discourses of conspiracy theories, and ecological approaches to understanding misinformation in a modern context. Dr. Hodson has also written for The Conversation Canada, so I'm delighted to speak to her more about the topics we've explored together. Pierre Normand is Vice President of External Relations and Communications. Pierre is responsible for developing and maintaining relationships with stakeholders in all sectors, as well as providing management and direction to the CFI's communications and government relations activities. He provides the vision and leadership necessary to project a vibrant corporate image and uphold the organization's strategic positioning in the public environment. Prior to joining the CFI, Mr. Normand held the position of Director of Communications at the Canadian Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences, where he was responsible for providing advice on governance and organizational issues, policy and government relations. Mr. Normand also served as the Chief of Communications at the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council and is a graduate of Université Laval in political science and communications. Thank you all for being here today. I'm very excited to talk about all the issues that we're going to be discussing. Um, if it's possible, could we get the first poll up? We're going to be running polls as the session progresses to kind of see who's in the room, how you're responding to what we're talking about, and to get to know a little bit about you, you should see it pop up on your screens right now. Thank you. And then if you are live tweeting or putting any information about the session or the conference online, please use the hashtag CSPC2022. All right, so let's start and Jagris, I'd like to begin with you. New and emerging research and evidence is highlighting the evolving challenges of misinformation and disinformation and barriers around public trust in science and new approaches need to be taken to ensure uptake and understanding. Um, so what I'm interested in asking you is, what is this new and emerging research in science telling us about what's happening in Canada? And what is also by extension happening to public trust in science? Yeah, thank you. This is a big question, as we all know. Um, and so every year, Edelman releases its trust barometer. And uh, according to the latest 2022 Edelman trust barometer, since the pandemic, trust in government, trust in business, and trust in journalism crucially is declining um, to, I think, levels that we're, we would all not be comfortable with. So, for example, two-thirds of Canadians say they don't trust government, and a similar number say they don't trust journalists. And, you know, this is huge for us when we think about communicating that science to the public. Um, on the other hand, we see that 
luckily, 75% of Canadians still do trust scientists. So I, I think that, you know, we can take hope in that. But that also means the flip side of a quarter of Canadians do not uh, even trust scientists. So, so things are looking a little dire. And what my research has shown is that there is so much information and misinformation out there that people can't possibly process it on their own. And they don't often even know where to find the right information. So they need to use heuristics, so mental shortcuts to uh, assess the information that's coming to them and determine who to trust. And this means that people are not trusting with their heads, but they're trusting with their hearts. So they're going to be more likely to trust people already in their community. They're going to be more likely to trust people who they already have a relationship with. And they're going to be more likely to trust people based on other cues um, that, that are not evidence-based. So, you know, do they perceive that person to be a good leader? Do they perceive that person to have the same values as they do? All of these things are influencing whether people trust independent of anything that, you know, science, journalism, or, or, or government tells them. So we really have to think creatively about how to tap into those non-evidence-based assessments that people are making every day and deciding who to trust and going to people in different communities around Canada um, who might be considered by those communities to be more trustworthy, right? Canadians are not a monolith. You know, somebody who lives in Montreal downtown is probably going to have a different set of values and, and different people they trust maybe than somebody who lives, you know, in, in the interior of British Columbia in a small town or somebody who lives in the middle of the prairies. So what we really need to look at is what are the geographical, regional, language, cultural, and racial differences um, in communities? And how can we reach those community leaders who maybe people already have a relationship with to use people who are already trusted um, as sources to report on science? And so, so that's sort of what we're looking at now is very you know, individualized, specific approach uh, to reaching people. Thank you so much for all of that. I actually have so many questions um, based off that when you were talking about people not trusting scientists or politicians, I was like, well, who do they trust? And you talked about their peer group. Do you, how do you think the pandemic has kind of fed into that? Or yeah, I, I there is. great question. So um, we know that trust has been reduced since 2020. So since the pandemic started and in part, I think it's because um, a lot of people are feeling a little worse off. A lot of people are feeling a little traumatized. There is research that shows, for example, a relationship between unemployment and belief in conspiracy theories. And we can extrapolate that to show that when Canadians are materially struggling, they will have a more difficult time trusting particularly the government who they may be expected to take care of them and then they felt maybe didn't do such a great job so they can lose that trust. And I think that's really what we saw over the pandemic. People's situations got materially more difficult, even if it was just temporary for some people, although we can argue it hasn't been that temporary. Um, but that material difference, I think, is probably something we can point to as contributing to this decline in trust that we've seen since 2020. Okay, that's that's really interesting. Um, and I'm going to come back to that a little bit later on. But I do want to ask um, Sally how her organization has kind of attempted to address that through science literacy. Yeah, great. Thanks so much. Um, Jiggers, I can't uh, agree more. So one of the things that we do at Genome BC is we have a gene school program that really focuses on uh, providing enriched uh, experiential science opportunities to kids in the high school area. And, and what we've really found is that knowledge and understanding is what leads to trust. And the kids are saying it needs to be integrated. SciTech needs to be integrated into our high school setting so that we become familiar with it so that our learning is actually in parallel with the advancement of science and technology that's taking place in society. So one of those, you know, one, I think it's really fundamental for organizations like ours to invest in this area and to make sure that kids are having the opportunity to learn with us so that these things don't become so, uh, I don't know, misunderstood, perhaps. The other thing I think it's really important, and Jagger's touched on this as well, is the importance of role models. Kids want to be able to learn from people who look like them and talk like them and, and that they find relatable. Um, they want to be inspired by people that they believe they can kind of 
be the same as. So I think these are the things that we're learning that, that this is really important. It's not just what we teach, it's who and where and how we teach it that's that's critical. Um, so we need diversity. We need to understand who are the people and we need to meet people where they are and where they want to learn. One, you know, a couple of really great examples through COVID was Bonnie Henry, the public health, uh, provincial public health officer in BC. One of the things she did very well was she identified people in communities that were the the kind of spiritual leaders or the leaders of each community to go out and help inform and pass on the messaging so that they weren't people weren't just hearing it from politicians they weren't just hearing it from public officials they were learning and hearing about it from people that they trusted and so she did a really really good job of that i would say similarly places like the canadian multicultural investor inventors museum are doing this exceedingly well it's it's who can we position as role models so that more and more people can see themselves in those roles going forward. I find that so, so interesting, that kind of scalar shift from a top down approach of building trust and creating more trusting um, political systems, but working at a more individual or community oriented level um, is really fascinating to me. And I wonder if there's some kind of trickle up approach to that. But before. Pierre, how about you? How are you working on addressing this issue of trust? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, the CFI last year conducted, in partnership with ACFAS in Quebec, a, a national survey of uh, young, young Canadians, 18 to 24, to find out about their perception and attitudes towards science. And uh, that was an important question, because why that age group is there was a time in their life where their perception, their beliefs, will shape some of the choices they will make and it will follow them for the rest of, the, of their life, whether it's term of careers, health choices, political choices. So trying to get into the, in, in, in their head to understand what motiva- motivate those choices, but more importantly, who are they and what influences those choices? Who are the influencers? And the results were just fascinating. And uh, uh, Jay, Chris, and Sally touched on two key, key points that came out of that survey, uh, the relationships, and how we teach science. But before I get to that, um, what really came through this survey is young people today, young Canadians live in a very complex environment where social media really rule the day. That's critical to understand. Uh, the other one is that there's a broad spectrum of attitudes uh, from those who are big believers in science, they embrace science to those who are actually not interested in science. And the separ- about 25% of the of the young people responding. So 25%, it's almost a majority government in Canada. Keep this in mind, this is a political scientist talking. And also, and again, Jay Grisman made made that point, is people surround themselves with like-minded people. So they are are very insular in their developing their own beliefs. So that's why, that's a challenge we need to understand. And the CFI will really, conducted that survey, we got to these things, and that's what we call the national conversation back in May, uh, to really try to unbundle those various issues, and understand what could be done. So we, we'll discuss this as the session go on, but it touches on some many of the points that uh, Sally and Jay Riz put forward this morning. Jay Riz, I'm actually going to bring this back to you to kind of comment on this ecosystem that Pierre is talking about. So can you talk about the media ecosystem that we're working within that kind of either undermines or can be leveraged to build trust in science? Yeah, I mean, this is a great point. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that we can divine from um, Canadians' current level of trust is that, you know, yeah, the media ecosystem that we are in um, is not working in some way, right? People are not trusting journalists. And as Pierre mentioned, you know, 25% of young people uh, aren't even interested in science. That aligns almost with the 25% of people that don't trust science. So I, I don't know if they're the same people, but it sure is interesting. Yeah, uh, social media has created this uh, media environment where we are all exposed to um, whatever we want at any given time. And that allows people to pick and choose the, um, that information that aligns with those values that we've been talking about. And um, I think this is, this is pro- a problem in a world where 
you know, maybe um, we're, we don't have the kind of literacy about uh, science and politics that maybe we need um, to understand some of the things that we're learning about. So, for example, in my research, uh, you know, we noticed that uh, when science around COVID rapidly changed, uh, you know, people were, a lot of people were less likely to have trust in that. They thought, well, the science is contradicting itself, so how can I trust the science? But in reality, we as scientists know that that is science working. Science should change. Science should occasionally contradict itself, and that means that we're getting better and we're learning more. But if the public doesn't realize that, um, then they can easily go online and find something that supports their fears, right? And, and one of the ways that people on social media break through all of that noise is by making people afraid and then by selling them um, reasons to not be afraid or selling them solutions to those problems. So there are what I call disinformation entrepreneurs out there that are looking to capitalize on people's misunderstanding. Thank you for that. And um, is it okay if I read from one of your articles that you wrote for the conversation? I would love that. It's from Sowing the Seeds of Science, because you also talk about in it um, that mis the complexity of misinformation, right? And you write, when people try to address vaccine misinformation, efforts are often ignored. This is because vaccine hesitancy, like all misinformation, is a complex problem. To address it, we need to think about a wide variety of different contributing factors that are systemic in nature and interact with one another. And then you go on to say, we live in an information environment which is increasingly complex and subject to dynamic intersecting systems and processes, which also kind of speaks to like all the different ways to address it. So I'm very interested in um, like in these, in these efforts that are very community level oriented. And Pierre, you kind of briefly touched on that, but I'd love to hear a little bit more from you on that. Well, it, it's, it's really um, uh, understanding where the, who influences our decision. And uh, when we looked at the role of social media, uh, Instagram and YouTube are the two main sources of information, followed by stream TV. So that's, uh, and that's really important because as you were saying, it's all algorithms uh, driven. So uh, they will, you will be provided with information you're looking for. And again, you, you get into the rabbit hole. And how do you get out of this? Because science is not about just uh, certainties. It's about understanding that the knowledge is changing, constantly evolving. And it's not exactly what we teach to, to kids, even in school today. We teach them defined uh, experiments with a, an expected result. What maybe we should, should be teaching them is we learn as we go. And, you know, the result that was good yesterday might not be the right one tomorrow because we've learned something new. It's more like the pro scientific process that's probably more interesting to, to, to share with people. And who are the credible source of information? Who are the credible role models? And that's really, really important today. Nehal, I wondered if I could just make a comment to build on what others were saying, because I, I wanted... I was just, well, I wanted to pick up on the public trust in science uh, piece because it's so nuanced, right? And one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about, and I really wanted to give a shout out to uh, the new report that just came out from the Chief Science Advisors Youth Council. They, they put out a really important report that I think all researchers and research funders should read. Um, and I had the privilege of being part of their uh, drafting journey. But there's a very strong section on science and society. And they talk about this issue that public trust is a nuanced concept. And we've touched on this a bit, but I just want to unpack it a little bit more because I think sometimes we equate anti-science with the issues, the questions around public trust and science. And I think the, um, the, the, the point that others are making, and I just want to emphasize, is that science occurs in a societal context right? And so the, the, there may be, you know, not so much questions when folks are, the public trust in science related to the concepts or the principles or the theories, but, you know, questions around the policies, the system, the scientific system, uh, the policy frameworks, the politicians that are funding science. I mean, there's a whole um, ecosystem around what um, comes from scientific evidence and advice. And I, and I think that it, it 
behooves us um, as research investors, funders, researchers to understand sort of the, the social context in which um, our, the communities we're trying to work with are, are uh, experiencing um, the relationship with science and scientists. And the report from the Youth Council really talks about the need to be very, therefore, deliberate, intentional, and as Pierre and Jay Gris and Sally have all said, relationship oriented. When we think about how to help in, in, in maintain the core, the, the foundation of, of public trust in science, grow it and, and take an inclusive approach to understanding why people may be not having the trust. It may not be in the scientific principles themselves, but in the context of which they've experienced or historically an ongoing science um, and or been excluded from it over time. So I, I just wanted to add that point. Thank you. I actually wanted to bring you in because your work very deliberately speaks to the complexities that Jake has brought up. Like you're not just functioning in an information and trust to the public, but you're also like taking part in those cultural, political, and social interventions that Jegris has written about the necessity of dealing with trust at those levels all at the same time. So I did want to ask you, especially at Genome Canada, which is a relatively newer scientific organization in the grand scheme of things. Oh, thanks. Yeah, well, and maybe what I can do too, I mean, uh, one of the things and, and, and uh, you know, Sally and I are, are very strong colleagues in this, in that the, um, this, what we call the Canadian Genomics Eco Enterprise, which includes Genome Canada and the six regional genome centers across the country, of which Genome BC is one. We, we were uh, uh, created as a, as a network um, 22 years ago. So uh, in response to the fact that Canada had not put in direct investment at the time in the Human Genome Project, and there was a real risk of being um, uh, put in the, uh, on the back foot uh, in investments in a, in a transformative science and technology that was really going to change our economy, our health, our um, agricultural systems, our natural resources. And it was very, I would say, prescient, and, and I really want to give out to shout out to Gino BC because they're real leaders in this. There was always, right from the start, a very strong mandate for genomics in society. So for really investing in the research um, into the environmental, ethical, economic, legal, and social implications of genomics. How are people experiencing it? How, uh, how are people uh, and communities understanding and, and, and engaging with the science and the technology um, so that it's, um, you know, so that we can promote uh, more take up, more adoption, um, and, and or understanding where their concerns are, so that we can adjust um, our program. So we've always invested in, in a very strong research program uh, for genomics and society, but also really strong efforts to partner um, in our different ecosystems to support knowledge mobilization of genomics. So COVID happened then. So, so 20 years of, of very strong work and investment uh, in, uh, in, in this space. And the, I, I just want to speak a little bit to COVID because it really, I think, in a way, um, helped put a bit more of a spotlight on the science of genomics um, and, and the role of genomics data um, in the COVID response because we were front and centre in tracking through our Canadian COVID genomics network that, that uh, uh, was funded by, the, by ICED, um, the, the, the evolution and the tracking of SARS-CoV-2 um, and understanding what was happening, sharing data across uh, the country, across provincial health authorities through our partnerships uh, to help inform public policy and decision making. And we were, we were, I have never seen the kind of requests we got from the media, and I'm sure Sally can speak to that too, the interest in what genomics was doing um, and supporting in terms of Canada's response. We had close to 700 science uh, articles written about um, our work in COVID, and we were engaged in, in that in 2021, 2021-22. Uh, 20, 20, but it made us think, what what are Canadians thinking? Has have their perceptions changed? And that's what I'll just speak about a little bit. Is that we thought we wanted to understand if COVID had made a a bit of a shift in Canadians' public perception. So we undertook uh, with Abacus Data in the spring of 2022 a look at uh, a national picture of how do Canadians understand and perceive genomics? Because again, we wanted to understand where where folks are at and where um, so to help support our own public engagement work over the longer term. And it told us five things. The top lines were that 
the familiarity and the awareness and the positive impressions definitely took a bump up because of the COVID pandemic response and the role of genomics in it. Um, that Canadians overall, though, aren't are modestly familiar. There's about 31% of Canadians who are familiar with genomics, but 70% were interested in learning more, which is we see as an opportunity. How do you come, come you know, help, you know, work with that interest? Um, but where the interest is, is in the specific applications, particularly as it relates to health, uh, disease treatment, et cetera. So how does it matter to my life? How does it matter to my day-to-day -day life, right? It's not the technicalities of the science. And, and uh, as you rightly pointed out, my own background, coming from a, from a humanities background, I'm not a hard scientist in the genomic space. But um, so the technicalities are, are, are more um, um, not where Canadians want to come at the conversation, but what does it mean to me? And therefore, they see the value in investing more, um, and they see the value in learning more. But um, we need to do more work to make sure that we break down what does that Canadian response mean? Because as, as I think Jager said, this is not a monolithic definition, and different communities do have different experiences and have been very excluded. And that's where I'm really interested in, is how do we learn from our our, our uh, data from from the public opinion survey to continue tracking, disaggregate it more so that we can build a more inclusive public engagement strategy that is grounded in making sure that communities that have been historically marginalized and from accessing genomics technologies for their healthcare benefits, et cetera, um, are, are able to be um, made, you know, be more engaged and help shape our own programming, our agendas, and what genomics is doing in Canada. Sorry, talked a lot, but I just wanted to sort of bridge to the survey um, and uh, add that to the conversation. Thank you, Perry. Pierre, you are nodding, and I know that you've also done work. <laughs> yes, yeah. it's really interesting. Um, I, 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 lo I love uh, when Perry is on a panel like that because we exchange information like that. And uh, I was thinking, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, I was doing quick calculation, and between the... Uh, 16% of question science are teenagers, you know, they trust their in instinct. 25% that are not interested in science. That's 51% of the population. Then there's another group, 20%, uh, that is interested in science, but they feel under-equipped to, uh, to understand the science. And it's linked with a lack of uh, skills in math, for instance. So uh, when you look at it in those terms, it's really interesting, but we also need to pull back a little bit and look at the broader con context. And I was reading this morning an article uh, by uh, Tasha Kerridan in, in the National Post, which is making a link about the illiteracy in the population and how they can be uh, subject to uh, misinformation, abuse from, from leaders. It's exactly what we were talking about a few minutes ago. And she had a very scary number in there. Uh, it's an American study that showed that uh, uh, one in seven American uh, fourteen percent of the population could not read the instruction on how to administer a medicine, a child medicine, to to a child. They did not understand. They did not have the the literacy skills to understand how to do this. Fourteen percent of the population. That's huge, you know. So it's very important to focus on the issues as we understand them, to talk about them the way we 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 were used to. But to remember that we have real challenges because it's, a, as someone was saying earlier this morning, this is a societal issue that is absolutely critical as we become more and more dependent on technology, new knowledge, uh, health, uh, health technologies are evolving quickly. So it's really important that we look at the full picture here. Nihal, if I can just just chime in, um, Gino BC did a, a survey in 2020 and 2022. And Whereas Genome Canada's survey was really kind of focused on this trust angle, ours was focused on genomic literacy, if you will, or understanding of science. Um, and this is kind of where our focus has been. And I would agree with everything that Normand and, and Perry are saying. We also saw bumps after COVID, although I would say not as much as we anticipated. Um, and what we did find was that there is still a large disconnect between the kind of people's understanding and, and what they think about genomics and its applications. So I think that there's this kind of gap and this disconnect due to a lack of understanding about the relevance and where we're applying these technologies and how people can engage with them and how they are making an impact in their lives, which gets back to Perry's comment about people don't necessarily care what's in that black box, what the technology is. That's not so much what the larger percentage of the population is interested in, 
but they're certainly interested in a better understanding as to how they can benefit from it. And I think from a communications perspective at the genomic enterprise and all of us who are involved in this, this piece of work, we really need to focus in on that. We need to do a better job of bringing these stories to life and sharing them in a meaningful and accessible way that people can understand as opposed to barraging them with science and things that are not accessible. We know that, that, that the understanding, the acceptance and appreciation and support of genomics and science goes up in accordance with education's educational level. We know that. So we need to make science accessible to people. And, and I just wanna come back before we lose this thread and go on to something else. Normand was talking about how we teach science and, and I, and I 100% agree, and I was listening to Perry talk about, you know, making it equitable and, and understanding, having a better understanding about the societal context, 100%. But I find it really curious that the scientific method that's taught is, as, as one of my, my staff, who is really, really the expert in this area said, Sally, it's linear. We're teaching science in a linear way when we need to be changing how we teach and asking people to think critically and allowing them to come along in this journey with us and help inform when and when they when they are comfortable and when they are not comfortable with how we are applying the science. And so all of these things, they're so wrapped up into one another. And, and we we have a responsibility. Well, we'll be talking about that a little bit. Thank you. That's actually a great segue. But in the meantime, let's get the second poll up, which asks if your organization has undertaken public opinion polling to look at trust and silence. So to carry on from what you were saying, Sally, um, one of the things that I'm really interested in, not just as a science editor, but I'm also an environmental and scientific journalist, is communicating the complexity of science and how you do that. And I think that we're talking here about, you know, going back to this ecosystem that Jagris has outlined, like an ecosystem approach. We're looking at scientists who are doing the actual research. We're looking about at communications, people who communicate the science. We're looking at the journalists who cover it. And then finally, we're looking at the audience who receives it, right? And so one of the things that I'm really, really interested in is how do you actually, when you talk about scientific literacy, how do you also get journalists to be scientifically literate enough to communicate that? Jay Gress, you look like you have something to say right there. I think that that's a key question um, because uh, we've seen, you know, over the last few decades, uh, you know, cuts to, to journalism in the name of, you know, uh, keeping up with, with social media, eating journalism's lunch, so to speak. Uh, and in, in the business of journalism has had to change. And as a result of that, uh, as well as, as deregulation, um, we don't have the, the workforce of journalists, you know, with full-time jobs, working for television, news, et cetera, anymore. Um, and so we don't have a science beat, really, um, not, not like we used to. And, and if you don't have dedicated journalists working a science beat, then your journalists don't necessarily have that deep knowledge that they need to be able to effectively interpret that science and communicate it to the public. So then we have organizations like The Conversation that come in to fill this gap in a beautiful way, working with, with scientists directly. But there are other problems with that too. Um, you know, and one of the ones I've studied, for example, is online harassment. So if I'm a scientist or a journalist and, and I put something out there to correct misinformation and then I get death threats, well, maybe I'm not going to feel much like doing that uh, in the future. That's such a good point. But I also wanted to ask like Perry and Sally, do you train journalists to cover the science that you want communicated? Sally, do you want to take that first? I would, I would say um, we, we, what we try and do is develop relationships, certainly in British Columbia with those journalists who, um, who appear to have an interest and seem to be following the work that we're doing. And then we invest in uh, helping get them the very best information. I think our train, that's how we view training. Um, we don't hold, you know, kind of formal training sessions for them by any stretch, but um, we certainly try and develop uh, relationships. And even when we don't have anything to pitch or there's nothing that we're really trying to get out there, we're always kind of checking in with them and asking if there's other ways we can help them 
understand other stories and other things that we're doing. So I would say it's that very traditional relationship building um, role that we try and play to the best of our ability within our capacity. And, and I would say we need to do more. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just, yeah, I, I would build on what Sally said. Exactly. I mean, I think that um, we, we at Genome Canada take a, take a similar approach. And, and it was, again, the opportunity that presented to talk about the science of genomics in the context of, of a very strong media interest during the height of the COVID pandemic. Uh, uh, really um, amplified that relationship building with uh, with journalists, uh, both on the broader innovation and science beat, but those who were coming at it from other angles. So um, that allowed us to then, as Sally said, pivot to talk about other dimensions or provide toolkits or try thinking about how best to share information uh, and link them very quickly to our network of scientists within the Cancogen network. But I, I, I did want to come at this from another angle too, because because I also think that um, something I think a lot about is how do we as funders, research funders, and so we are, we support the work of, of the Conversation Canada. We believe that it's a great vehicle uh, to help support knowledge mobilization of the research coming out from the researchers we fund. But also, what is our responsibility to, to invest in, so it's not a side hustle, but it's actually invest in, in the research requirements of our programs, public engagement science communications and knowledge mobilization uh, for the researchers we fund. I think that research funders don't do a good enough job of embedding those expectations, requirements, but the investment and the capacity to allow researchers to do it. I mean, I know that there's also institutional challenges, but again, I think this notion of invest in what you care about. And if we, if, if we as research funders incentivize our resources on the research side as well to, you know, do we require lay abstracts and lay summaries for all of our research programs? Do we do impact storytelling, um, as Sally said, uh, about how the research we're funding supports uh, the day-to-day -day lives of Canadians? Do we amplify our partners' work uh, uh, and what they're doing as opposed to just our own corporate communications? So I think there's a lot besides working with journalists that we can do as research funders uh, to take res the responsibility for our role in, in public trust building and public engagement that, that I'm really interested in looking at. And I think others are because it, we have a fundamental responsibility, I think, to use our resources in such a way and to work with our partners in the research funding ecosystem. Um, I think there's a lot of siloing that happens across us as well. And I'm really interested in you know, I think it's a success for us when we lift up what Genome BC is doing and all of the genome centers. It's a success for us when CFI is doing what it's doing. And we should be telling those stories and amplifying others and working together. Yeah, the collaboration is really key. I would also, I would just comment that I think what I've certainly seen over my 14 years in this space is I've really seen a shift in academia. And, and it's not often I throw out compliments to academia because I think sometimes they move very, very slowly um, and they're very siloed. But I will say that when it comes to um, really informing and bringing out these this kind of new generation of scientists, they're coming out really understanding their responsibility and their role yeah. in making science accessible and communicating it. So that engagement piece from an academic perspective has definitely, definitely been enhanced over the last decade. Thank you. Can I, yeah, can, I, can I interject here? Because uh, Perry uh, raised a very important point, uh, the role of funding, funding over the organizations. And, um, you know, we invest in research equipment, research facilities. So, uh, you know, I mean, telling the story of the piece of equipment in the lab and the real story is the opportunities that are being created by having the equipment in the lab, enabling people to do something great. And that forced us to really think about how we approach communications. Uh, at the beginning of the CFI, it was, well, great. We are going to announce that we have installed that many microscopes and that many labs. It's not good enough, you know? So we shifted the conversation. But then our staff is not said, well, we're not science communicators. We don't understand the science. Okay, but you're an intelligent person. Tell me what you understand. What benefits do you see from the layman's perspective? So tell the story from that angle, you know, and get, of course, uh, content, scientific content to help you along. 
But you know, the formula we've adopted, uh, we used to say, it's all about grannies, babies, and puppies. I know that's funny, but grannies, I mean, like you have to be clear, use plain language when you talk about the stories. Babies, tell me what will change. You know, what's the message of hope in what you're talking about? And the puppies make it an, an emotional connection. That's what we need to do, even as funders. You know, we have to go back to the basics of proper communications, human to human communications. And I, I love add, that. And, and I might add that we do have a couple of science communicators on our staff now, and that really helps. And they understand, they link it with, with the social justice, they link it, they link it with the LGBTQ uh, community, they link it to families that are experiencing uh, rare diseases and how research is helping them. So that's a difference. And that's, this is how, fun, how as funders, we need to talk about it. I love grannies, babies, and puppies. And, and I would say, uh, building on what both Pierre and Sally mentioned, I think we still have a ways to go um, in academia. Uh, we do have, you know, a, a new generation of people coming up and interested in writing for the conversation or talking about um, their work on social media. And there's great initiatives like Timothy Caulfield's Science Up First, which um, encourages scientists to uh, you know, approach misinformation on social media wherever they see it. That said, we are still not rewarding or promoting the researchers who are doing that work. So they're doing it in addition. To their work. And while SHRC has made great strides, and NSERC, the Tri Councils, have made great strides in, in recognizing um, open science and encouraging uh, science, scientists to make our academic publications available to the public and not paywalled, and that's super important, the public's not going to read our academic papers. So we also need to be recognized amongst our peers and amongst our institutions and the granting agencies for the type of work that we do when we are communicating the science to the public. And, and I think that is very key until we figure out how to reward you know, academics with tenure promotion and grants for that kind of public engagement, um, we, we might be still behind um, and siloed, Sally, in, in academia. Thank you for that. Um, can we get the third poll up, please? And that's just a follow-up question. If you responded yes to the last poll, um, please let us know what you learned when you tried to examine trust in science. Um, so Jagers, my next question is for you, please. Um, given what we know about the science of trust, what does it suggest in terms of approaches that will have the most impact on shoring up Canadians' trust? Thank you, that is such a huge question. Um, and, and as you know, Nahal, I take an ecological view, being a systems view, big picture of the whole thing. Uh, this is not uh, an immediate or, or simple action. This is combined actions over time at different levels. So, you know, in, importantly, I think we can't ignore the, the piece that I talked about here earlier, which is this material conditions, like how are Canadians lives? Are they harder or easier? And, and I think it, it behooves, um, you know, government and, and corporations, businesses to, to think about how they can make people's lives a little bit less uh, you know, uh, difficult, um, because that will increase uh, trust in, in these bodies. But, um, you know, coming up from the individual level, we can look at um, some of the things we talked about, improving education around the process of science as much as like science is a fixed thing, which, which isn't working. Uh, we could talk about um, improving literacy around government uh, policymaking um, so that people understand, you know, sort of how that side of things works. Uh, but we also need to meet people where they are and empower, again, our scientists and science communicators to do their job in their own communities, providing support for them to do it. Um, you know, like I mentioned uh, a minute ago, uh, incentives. So, uh, you know, can we support their career progression or can we support them in other ways for doing this work uh, and being there for people if and when they do experience online harassment that might discourage them from going forward on some of these channels. Um, but at a policy level, we could also look at algorithms and how they are delivering us kind of like the junk food, right, of information. Um, and how could algorithms work better in the public interest? So, for example, 
In China, TikTok, the, the social network that shows those short little videos, um, they are required to show a certain amount of scientific based content. So, you know, educational videos for, you know, every, every hour of consumption. You know, if you uh, look at TikTok in China, but if you come to North America and you look at TikTok here, there's no law that tells TikTok that they have to serve up educational content. So people who access TikTok here are not getting that educational content unless they actively seek it out. So there's little policy tweaks that could improve our social media experience that could nudge you know, social media into providing us algorithmically slightly better um, content without having to resort to things that shut down freedom of speech. You know, it's sort of like Canadian content laws were for a broadcast era. We need public interest laws for an algorithmic social media era. So is this where you see like the role of government coming in at that policy level that creates then the conditions for these relationship building activities at the community level? Absolutely. And, you know, the social media companies like Meta, which is Facebook and Instagram um, or Twitter or, or, you know, they are saying, please, governments regulate us because they feel like they cannot take the initiative as businesses. It would hurt their profit margin. But if they are regulated by governments, then they will be able to say to all their shareholders, well, we had to do this. So, so I think that is definitely part of it. Um, and then, of course, on the relational level, we already talked about going to community leaders that are specific to different communities, because, again, it's not a one size fits all model. But that's why we see there are things individuals can do. There are things that um, organizations like schools need to do. There are things that communities can do. And then there's a policy piece as well. And that's when it becomes a systematic problem. There's also something that you said at the beginning in that um, people trust those with leadership qualities, right? And I wonder too, is like if supporting leadership development in academic and in researchers is another thing that could be done. Yeah, that's a really great question because again, if we look at that, it's not a one size fits all model. No. My definition, my personal definition of leadership might be different than Pierre's or Perry's. And so I think that there's not a one size fits all for what is going to resonate with people, you know, as, as a strong leader. Some people, for example, you know, in Sally's example earlier, looked at Bonnie Henry and we, and we actually have data on this. They looked at Bonnie Henry and they thought, wow, what a great leader. I will trust what she says. Other people we know do not, right? So, so I think the, the tricky part about leadership training is there's no one size fits all. So instead, I like to recommend encouraging scientists um, and you know, public health officials, et cetera, to get more involved in their own communities so that they can be that community touch point, which is, which is trusted by people. So another thing that came out of the Edelman Trust Report was that uh, trust in outsiders among Canadians has gone way down. We say we don't even trust people from other provinces. Um, but our trust in our coworkers and our neighbors, so community members close to us, is, is going up a little bit. So we trust those who we are already um, you know, close to and who we see a lot. And we are not trusting people who we feel are outside our circles. So the more we can get involved as scientists in our circles and, and share our science-based, evidence-based views with others, I think we'll get farther that way. Thank you. Um, Perry, what do you think the role and responsibility of funders is like are here? Thanks, Nahal. This is such a terrific conversation. I think so... Um, just my my that my head is sparking in terms of things that we need to be thinking about. Certainly at Genome Canada, listening to my colleagues and having thought about it, and, I, and as I said, having read, for example, um, uh, work by sister organizations abroad like Genomics England, for example, I want to give an example of what they do in this space that we're really thinking about. But also just coming back to the Youth Council Science Report that I referenced at the outset, which uh, was released a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, I really do think the responsibility of funders is threefold. We have resources and we need to use them to incent the behavior that we want to see or, or uh, invest in the change we want to make. And so, again, I would go back to looking um, um, at our funding programs uh, through the lens of if we value uh, knowledge mobilization, science communications, and public engagement, the research and innovation funds, fun programs we fund, we should invest 
in the capacity building and the and the efforts of those researchers to do that. And then we should invest in our role to amplify it. And um, and certainly, you know, we've been looking more at that. Do we do that? But we do we do it systematically? I wouldn't say we do. And we need to do more as 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 we were saying earlier. And and I think too. Um, you know, and I want to give a shout out to my amazing colleague, Sapna Mahajan, our director of genomics and society. I mean, she is really working with, again, Sally and colleagues across the country to really embed knowledge mobilization strategies within all of our research programs. And not just at the programmatic level, but we've moved to a challenge based model. So at a portfolio level, like how do you integrate um, a uh, portfolio level impact and knowledge mobilization um, and to ensure that um, there is take up of the research, but also right into the policy and regulatory uh, systems, but also adoption by Canadians. Um, and how do you embed that um, in, um, in all of our programming? The second thing I would say is amplifying uh, partnerships. We are very much uh, intentionally and deliberately um, working a much more ecosystem partnership, I would say, uh, than perhaps in the past, no, both within our re pan Canadian network with the genome centers, but within the federal ecosystem as well. And you know, it's it's in our collective interest to support a strong science foundation in this country, and therefore um, to lift up, you know, the the calls for investment. Uh, uh, in science, but also to work together to help educate those that make the decision making. So, um, you know, another big focus for us is talking to decision makers and parliamentarians uh, to help them understand the value uh, to Canada's economic growth and social agenda and environmental agenda by investments in science. Um, and how, again, do we make that relevant to them and their constituents in their ridings? I think that's really important. Uh, the th the third thing I would say is also diversifying who uh, we're, voices we're lifting up, who we're helping train, and whose organizations really need to be at the center of the science agenda. And we have done a lot of work to uh, support, um, as others were saying, role model, like the, the creation of a, uh, a, a, a bigger critical mass of, for example, Indigenous genomic scholars through um, um, a more um, long-term investment in the, in the strategic plan of SING Canada out of University of Alberta, led by Drs. Kim Talbert and Jessica Kolopenik, who are really focused on trying to grow uh, the next generation of Indigenous uh, uh, genomic scholars who are very much, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, putting putting a genomics agenda at the heart of, of a, a community agenda and a decolonization agenda. And it's incumbent upon us as a funder to lift up their work. And we're, you know, very interested in having similar conversations with the Canadian Black Scientist Network who are doing similar things with Black, with black scholars, including trying to ensure that they are creating and supporting young Black scientists to mentor the next generation. And again, as a research funder, we need to be thinking about how do we lift up their work? Because we all said, you know, the more, you know, the more folks see the um, folks like them talking about the role of science and it helps build trust. So those are three things and how that we're thinking about doing, uh, learning from others, um, but that I'm very passionate about trying to um, trying to uh, stimulate a conversation, you know, within our organization and certainly more broadly. Thank you so much, Perry. What about you, Pierre? What do you think the CFI's roles, like role and responsibilities are here? Um, I think Perry really captured the, the essence of uh, how we can build trust with, with people. Uh, the CFI, uh, with its mandate to invest in research infrastructure, is not in the same space as the granting agencies or Genome Canada. But that being said, communications for us is a form of accountability, public accountability. We have received uh, over $9 billion of federal funding over the years. We are matched by the province. That means over the past 20-something 20, 20 years, we invested well over $20 billion in research infrastructure in this country. So it's a huge responsibility. And we, communications for us is one of the ways we can be accountable to the public. The other is that as an organization, we work with uh, other actors. Uh, we're engaged with the Congress of the Humanities, Humanities and Social Sciences, for instance. We work with ACFAS because their mandate, their role is really to raise awareness about science and research in the among the Canadian public. So we work with them so they can help us to 
to, 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 to reach their own goals. So we, we build a coalition of the willing. And as I mentioned earlier, we're very, very careful the way we talk about what we support. You know, we don't focus on the molecule. We really focus on the end result. And um, excuse me. We really focus on the end result and, and, and try to show what, how, how we support will help address a, a human need, you know, rather than just focusing on the story of the molecule, which is hard to explain for most people. So how can we get around this? So uh, finding the right, the right language when we communicate. Thank you so much. Um, can we get the fourth poll up there, please? Which asks, do research funders have a responsibility to enhance public trust in science? Um, so we're getting to the very end, but before we're done, I actually want to talk about how do we move on from here and what solutions are there? Um, Jay, Chris, I'm going to start with you, then I'm going to go to Sally, and then Pierre, and finally, Perry, we're going to end with you. But my question to you, Jay, Chris, is how do we engage and build trusted relationships with key populations, especially those in marginalized communities, in the pursuit and use of scientific knowledge? You know, I think uh, all of my esteemed panelists have done a great job at touching on this. So I'm going to wrap up some of the things we've already heard. Um, you know, making sure that you are engaging with diverse populations where they are, meeting people where they are is very key. Um, you know, taking a, a, a bottom up rather than a top down approach to trust, like why should people trust us just because we tell them to, right? And then looking at how we might be able to earn that trust. So it also means listening to people as much as you talk to them. We can't continue to communicate science using a broadcast model that worked for um, you know, a bygone age. Instead, we need to be more dialogic. Um, you know, we see, sort of see what people are talking about and why. Um, Pre-bunking sometimes works. So, um, you know, if you can reach people with the science before they hear the misinformation, that can work. But, you know, that's hard to do. It's hard to predict what might come down the pipeline. So the best thing to do when you are confronted with misinformation is to ask a lot of questions figure out what's really driving belief in, in that, in that non-evidence-based information so that you can over time counteract it. But we have to also let go of this idea that we are somehow invulnerable to misinformation and it's people, other people out there, people with maybe low levels of, of literacy and in, in whatever. Well, those are the people who are really vulnerable. Mm -mm, we're all vulnerable. And we are vulnerable most when the information that we're confronted with aligns with things that we believe already to be true. Remember, we make decisions with the heart more than the head. So I think it also means that we have to approach this with humility as scientists, as policymakers, as funders. We have to recognize that, you know, it's not something that we have the secret to and we have to convince everybody else of the evidence. No, there's going to be issues where we might fall victim to misinformation as well. And so engaging in that dialogue, asking questions and reaching people where they are in their communities by making those connections um, are the best ways we're going to address this problem. Thank you so much, Jay Chris. Sally, um, I'm really curious about, like you talked about a whole bunch of different strategies that you're using at mm -hmm. Genome BC, but I'm curious as to like, what have been the most effective um, to strengthen the trust between science and the public to help them like to inform decision making and policy development like what have you found in your experience yeah great question and huge uh question um i mean I i'm gonna take it back to our to more regional focus i think because this is a mass massive undertaking and i think unless we collaborate and unless we approach this almost from a sy system uh systems level we probably won't uh, accomplish what we hope to do. And I think together we can certainly start to chip away at all of that. Look, I, I would say transparency is, is really key here. Um, I think what we what we should always try and do and what we have tried to do is, is kind of, again, meet people where they are, make information relevant and accessible, understand that the earlier that we can engage people in this process, and the more that we can make the learning parallel with how the technology and the science is actually 
impacting our lives, um, the the better off we're going to be. And it comes back to uh, kind of this understanding and, and, and commitment to wanting to educate kids and give kids an opportunity to be exposed to ask questions about what it is that genomics is bringing to society. They go home and they talk to their parents about it. They go out into their communities and talk to their friend groups and their social groups about it. So there is no silver bullet, but I think giving people a place to learn and ask questions about what it is we are trying to introduce and have them engage with is key. I think understanding that it's time that the methodology changes and how we teach and how we engage and who does that teaching and where we do it and to be flexible and curious about that um, and trying to work with the science, the school system, working with the science teachers, doing all of those things. So, I mean, I think there's that component of it. I think it's incumbent upon us to also understand that our technology and the tool that we are, you know, kind of behind is not always the right answer for every question. And, and, and it's okay to also kind of open up the dialogue and ask people, so what are you comfortable with and what are you not comfortable with and give them that opportunity. And this speaks to genomics and society or genomics and society and the whole social science aspect that we've uh, within the genomic enterprise, uh, we're very early adopters on trying to integrate um, into it. And, and I want to, I just want to finish with, with one other thing. And I, 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 I don't want to say this, but I'm I'm going to say it is Nor Normand has really touched on this. Everyone here on the panel has touched on the importance of incentivizing and, you know, making sure that when people go out and do a really good job of this engagement, that somehow we find a way to incentivize them. I 100 percent agree. I also think that in our organizations and funding organizations, we maybe don't invest in enough in developing our capacity level to actually initiate and motivate this change. Communications, knowledge translation, genomics and society are very underfunded in relation to the core science. And I understand that, but we are no longer just funding foundational and discovery-based science. We are now at a stage in the continuum where application and translation is, is happening and it's paramount. That is going to require more capacity for all of us to do a better job of everything that we've been talking about today. So I think, you know, at some point there has to be a bit of an adjustment because otherwise we're going to continually run into capacity challenges. Uh, having said all of that, I, I think we can do it. And I think we're doing a really good job of trying to hone in on what we should do better. But the more we have to tailor, the more we have to think about meeting people in their own space, the more we have to try and think about these more systemic changes and systems changes, the more investment and commitment we all need to make to those areas. Thank you so much. Um, Pierre, what do you think um, funders like CFI can do um, in partnership with academics to help address the challenge of public trust in science? It's uh, difficult to follow two such uh, great interventions. Um, one thing to keep in mind is really misinformation has been around for a, for a very long time. You know, when people start to communicate, there was already misinformation. So what's happening now is the technology, especially in the context of uh, social media, it's enhancing its impact. So th I think this is the premise we need to start with. Um, it's also an issue that is resonating with a number of leaders, senior leaders within the federal government, because they went through the pandemic, they went through the response, the, all these things. So they see, is the Canadian public uh, developing a negative attitude towards science and it's big investment for the federal government and even the provinces. So again, this is an issue that's really starting to resonate more and more with the leadership. Now, uh, last uh, May, when or June, when we held our national conversation on these issues, we brought together some science educators, a philosopher, uh, representatives of the business community, uh, provincial uh, representatives 
we're talking about skills and education in their provinces. So we brought all these people together. We started a conversation. We published a short report. Today, we're having this conversation. The real issue we're facing collectively is how do we keep the momentum? You know, we can have all the great conversation, but we all need a commitment to continue this conversation because it's so critically important to the, the country. So uh, I know the CFI, we are interested in continuing this. Uh, it's not just a one year, 25, 25th anniversary uh, event for us. We are determined to keep this conversation going and we'll be reaching out to you colleagues because we want, we want to hear your ideas of how we can continue to, to bring this forward to the public in the public space. Thank you so much, Pierre. Perry, and then the same question to you. What do you think are practical ways that research funders like Genome Canada um, can work with academics to help, like, to help address the challenge of public trust in science? Yeah, thanks so much. And um, again, just really want to, um, you know, uh, underscore some of the points colleagues have made, which, um, again, you know, go back to we need to invest in what we value. And I really, really like Sally's point about that includes the capacity building uh, within our organizations to um, be on the cutting edge of how to support knowledge mobilization, translation, uh, public engagement, and and then how do we um, look at our funding portfolios accordingly? Uh, because it is exactly right, the intersectionality of what we're investing in on the hard science and the technology side with societal complexities and needs is only going to continue. Um, and, and, and so um, I really want to underscore the issue around incent investment and invest incentivize what you value, uh, partnerships. Um, but I just want to speak to a few other things that we're, we're trying to do to um, um, be, you know, again, go where people are, but also the pathways to science. And again, this was something that came out into the, the Youth Council Science Report. And I'm really glad, Nahal, you posted it in the chat because I think it really is a great resource. But they talk about the pathways to science are not linear. And so the, um, um, you know, this, the, the, and somebody put in the chat, and I'm so glad Vanessa did, let's talk science, right? The, this is a, this is an, um, um, you know, uh, uh, within the school system, but also sort of um, um, a complementary to it, is that the, the role of, uh, and we certainly partnered very strategically with Let's Talk Science over the last couple of years to um, uh, create a virtual online symposia uh, on various science issues and, uh, um, and bringing in the genomics perspective. So I'm, I'm, I'm a, a want to give a big shout out to the work that they're doing and other uh, science um, organizations like them. Um, the other thing we're doing is we are putting some of our investment into helping train the uh, researchers we fund in how to write for the Conversation Canada and how to, you know, again, putting our money into it, how so, so that they can, um, uh, you know, they have lots of important uh, findings coming out of the research. So we're creating some workshops uh, in a bit of a strategic series uh, to help support support their uh, ability to um, be uh, knowledge mobilizers and public uh, engagement uh, champions through, through their research. Um, and the last thing I wanted to point to was um, something that uh, I'm really interested in that our colleagues at Genomics England are doing. They've been a part of a project called, called Socializing the Genome uh, since 2016, and it builds on this massive survey called Your DNA, Your Say. And it really helped because in, in, in England, there is a very uh, uh, national approach to genomic medicine and, and, and precision and medicine and precision health using genomics. And they are very much world leaders in this area. But they recognize, as Sally talked about, the, the challenge with, with the societal dimensions of getting various communities to be interested in being part of the, you know, uh, uh, having, having genomic testing done, having their gene sequence to build onto the databases that exist uh, within the, um, the genomic medicine framework they have. So they created this initiative called Socializing uh, the Genome to better understand why community, certain communities were disengaged and how to come to them and meet them where they're at, which everybody's been saying. And they took an interesting approach where they actually worked with um, um, uh, those uh, like experts in science communications and marketing uh, to create a series of animated videos uh, to uh, really uh, appeal to various communities based on, um, you know, a lot of work to understand how best to 
talk about the work to make it plain language, non-jargony, all that kind of thing. And then they have coupled that with community ambassadors, as others have talked about. Like, so there are things that I think we can learn from, from best practices from our colleagues um, at the other genome centers and from genome funders around the world to uh, take our public engagement uh, strategy to the next level, but, but centering it in that in inclusive lens. Like I think inclusive public engagement is really what we need to be talking about. Thank you so much, Perry. Thank you so much, Jay, Chris, Sally, and Pierre. We talked about how complex the media environment is that science communication functions in. We've talked about approaches to education, to government policy, um, to training journalists. We've talked about requiring academic research to have this public education and outreach component. So I really enjoyed how we took as, as a starting point or the basis for this conversation, the complexity and the multiple approaches that needed to be undertaken in order to address the issue of trust in science. Thank you so much for sharing with us. For the last 15 minutes or so, we're gonna take questions. If anybody has a question, please turn on, like raise your hand and I'll call your name. You'll need to turn on your mic and camera to be able to ask questions that way, or you can just type them into the chat. Um, and we also have one last poll to go up, so that will also um, get posted now. So if you have any questions, please just let me know. I'm not seeing any raised hands because I can't see everybody on the screen right now. Um, Perry, I do also want to talk about, like very quickly to ask about what your experience has been with publicly communicating science on the conversation. Oh, and that, oh, we looks, I, I can answer that. And it looks like we did get a question in the chat. Uh, right. So we yeah. may want to take that one. And then if we have time, I can come back to that. Absolutely. Um, so the question is, do you have any thoughts about how government scientists might approach these issues? They are at an intersection of low trust in government, but still relatively high trust in science. I think, Pierre, you would be able to respond to that question quite well. Uh, it, because I, I come with, with history and a few years ago, that was an issue. Uh, the, the, the role of government scientists, how they were communicating some of those issues. But I think this, this, uh, this thinking has evolved over the years. Um, you know, governments are really in a bind in some aspect, in the sense that they invest huge amounts of money in all sorts of research. Um, and, you know, some of the results might not be, might, they might not want to share some of the results uh, right away with the public for various reasons, security, uh, health, uh, diverging uh, findings, you know, there's many reasons. So it's a very difficult uh, position to be in. What's important is a commitment to transparency and making sure that wh whenever you, you do this, you are communicating clearly, but you're also you're accountable, but you're also transparent about what you do. So, and I think that's a message back that all the, the whole system can send back to gov to governments, government leadership, uh, because I was quite interested in your comments about this, uh, Jay Gris. I think that's an important aspect. And I think right now there's a window of opportunity to really uh, raise awareness about this particular issue and how important it is. If I could maybe just build on what Pierre was saying. Sorry, Jay Gris, uh, would you like to go first and I can follow? Oh, thank you, Perry. Yes, for it. I, I was going to say absolutely agree with Pierre. I spent a year um, as a science policy fellow with Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, and this was uh, before the pandemic. And um, they were looking, well, how can we better communicate climate science to the public? And um, what I felt after spending that time with them was that they really needed to allow their scientists, we need to allow government scientists to come forward and communicate their science across channels without having to get one, two, three levels of approval to do so. And I think our government leaders need to feel confident that they've hired the right people for the job. And if a scientist says something in public, and then the government leader needs to say, well, actually, we did take the science into consideration, but we also had to take these other 
constituents or, or, or other things into consideration, maybe, you know, business leaders, et cetera, et cetera. I think that transparency that Pierre talked about is key. So, so more discussion with Canadians on how these decisions are made and the fact that, yes, we are using the science, but it was not the only thing that's informing the decision. Um, I, yeah, and I think the government scientists can be a huge part of that if they are allowed to move forward and, and benefit from, from all of the communications tools that we've been talking about today. That's, that's a really great point. I just wanted to add two things to that question. I'm so glad we got that from in the chat. Um, I th When I think about this, I think about it again from a systems level and then an individual level. I think at the systems level, I think, and as Pierre said, I think we have, and I really love Jagers that you were part of that because I think that's exactly a great, that, that fellowship is actually a great model, right? Like creating more collision opportunities and exchange with government scientists and academic scientists in the policy space, for example, I think is really important. Um, but what I was going to say was, you know, we're very lucky that we've seen with the chief science advisor and the growth of science advisors within each department, right? Uh, within the federal government anyway. And I think that that could be an interesting uh, conversation. I mean, uh, for, for the, that circle of chief science advisors across different departments is how do they also contribute to this national conversation or how do we continue to mobilize our scientists, whether they're in government, whether they're in academe, whether they're not for profit, around to 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 continue to strengthen public trust in science because they're investing in it, they're doing it, and and what's how can they uh, uh, you know work with the broader ecosystem? So you know that could be a, an interesting conversation uh, uh, for the chief science advisors at the different departments to have. For, at the individual level of government scientists, I'd also really encourage, like, for example, avail yourselves of platforms like the CSPC, right? Like, get out to the CSPC and meet your colleagues who, and, and work with them, uh, find ways to work with them in cross-collaboration, cross-sectoral collaboration. Um, find uh, opportunities maybe for a, um, sabbaticals or exchanges with um, research, in, you know, institutions or um, universities. Uh, get out, make sure that part of your work is, um, you know, finding ways to collaborate um, in some of the, you know, um, you know, Canadian science, the network of Canadian science centers, etc. Like, I, I think it's important, again, as we talked about is, you know, thinking, thinking of your role as a scientist, as a communicator, how do you then get into your community? How are government scientists across the country getting into some of their community issues, right? Um, so just some, some uh, reflections. Can I just add one aspect here? When you talk, when you think about government, it's more than just um, a government scientist. It's also government policy, policy yeah. analysts, policy makers. Yeah. Very, very important. And yeah. there's something that disappeared over the past uh, number of years. We used to have those briefings of policy analysts on very specific topics. You know, the networks of central vaccines used to hold those, you know, and you would get 25, 30 analysts coming to this because they want to learn about this. When we released the uh, the IPCC report a number of years ago, there was uh, the CFI held a meeting uh, for, for that here and other policy analysts were there. So maybe we need to look at the some of the tried and true uh, uh, mechanism that are still are, that we were used before and see if we can revive in some format, this kind of information, you know, concise, you know, access to top of the line information by experts, you know, who can present complex information in a way that is clear and will be meaningful for those using this. And also understanding what are the current priorities of the government. There's no need to talk about A, if government is interested in B, C and D, you know, so we need to align these things. Just on a regional pers uh, from a regional perspective, it's really interesting that you raised uh, the policy analysts and the and the government scientists. At Genome BC, we've been trying to bring these groups together with our academic researchers and our social scientists to kind of start to develop more collaborations and to talk about what is it that we can provide you with. But interestingly, we're having a really difficult time identifying them and having access to them. So I don't know what we're, what the stumble is or why, it, but it seems like almost we have to figure out how to get behind the curtain because because we're having a really hard time and it's hit and miss. Um, so I think anything that we can do to kind of open up those lines of communication and access to everybody would be really welcomed. Yeah. 
It used to be a great tool, uh, the printed uh, directory of the government staff here in Ottawa, and you could go for policy section, you could get their name and contact information. Now you have GETS, but it's a lot more uh, laborious to get to the information. Thank you so much. We do have another question. I think this will be the last question that we take, and it's from Marianne Mader. How can we support partnerships with science engagement organizations and professionals across Canada and existing science engagement infrastructure, for example, science centers and museums? Harry, I think that's a good one for you. Well, I think it's a great question and I'll make some comments and I think it's really going to be great for folks who are tuning in today to, um, Marianne, put it in the chat, but but um, uh, the Canadian Association of Science Centres is doing a closing panel on, on some similar themes um, on November 18th at CSPC and I think would be a great compliment to what we've been doing today. Um, and I, I, but I want to make sure Sally gets a chance because you actually referenced your work with, um, uh, I, I can't remember the name, but there was a museum that you referenced earlier that I think it might be interesting to talk about. But I think it is important. And we we have in the past, uh, and we're looking at this again uh, with the Canadian Museum of Nature, for example, here in Ottawa, um, where uh, Dr. Danika Gusni is now the head, having come from NSERC, and the opportunities to think about um, as they open up and as the you know and become much more of a museum without walls right and 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 engage uh, in partnership um what what are things that we can do there again to create um um, more of a community focused science communications um, opportunity. We've also been talking with our director of equity and indigenous engagement, how one, we even work with artists, for example, um, in terms of science communications and artists in, in a community oriented context. So I think there's lots of um, opportunity. I, I, I do want to underscore what Sally said. I think the issue is capacity and how one manages uh, these different partnerships so that we're maximizing impact. Um, and that's something we're thinking a lot about is how, um, but I don't know, Sally, did you, I, I, I wanted to throw that to you in case, because you had mentioned some work that you were doing. Well, well, I did, I did mention the, the museum earlier, but that, that's yeah. more just from a, I, I really wanted to give them a shout out right. because I think they're doing an amazing job at kind of identifying people in communities and, and, you know, kind of having similar people give messages. But I think I would just talk to, uh, for instance, Science World in Vancouver, um, where we we partner extensively and we look for opportunities to collaborate, whether that be celebration, science celebrations around the province where June, June School will piggyback and we'll try and create even greater uh, kind of community opportunities. But also we, we were in a really fortunate position uh, seven years ago to be able to go to, to Science World and, and actually invest a significant amount of money. Um, but to do to take our kind of gene school DNA kind of activity right into the heart of Science World. And for seven years, we've been able to kind of in their lab zone, show what gene school is to all of the kids who come around. So not everyone has that opportunity. And certainly it's not something we have all the time. It was just something that we identified. And, and during the pandemic, I mean, these science museums have been hit really, really hard. They've had no gate revenue. They, they do amazing work and we need to find ways to now get them back up uh, and, and running. Um, so what we just look for is these opportunities. We don't want to develop things from the ground up if other people are doing amazing work. Right. What we then do is say, how can we collaborate? What can we bring to this discussion or this collaboration? And we join forces. Sometimes it's an investment in money. Sometimes it's an investment in our volunteers to help them do their work and vice versa. So um, so certainly these kinds of collaborations are possible and it doesn't always require monetary contribution. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. And that brings us to the end of the session. Thank you, Jacris, Sally, Pierre, Perry. Um, I really appreciate it being in conversation with all of you. Um, thank you all of you for your attention and I'd encourage you to attend more of the conference and more of the sessions and yeah, and check out the Conversation Canada.